Let me talk to you. That's right. Duddy Fastlane was today on October 7th, 2023. And I, I only mentioned a date because I don't know if this will be uploaded Sunday or Monday. So I'll put that in there. And we are here to talk about it. Yes, this is the first wrestling review I've done uh, solely on the channel. The first is a podcast. So should be fun. But before we get into the card and my thoughts, I want to hear your guys' comments along the way in review. What did you guys think about Fastlane? Comment your favorite match. Comment your least favorite match. Comment your grade of the show and your favorite and least favorite key moments of the card. I look forward to hearing from you guys. Now, let's see what I have to say about it. So, I want to go in firsthand and say I usually don't. Nowadays, I don't have high hopes and expectations for WWE pay-per-views. And I set myself up to do that so I don't overhype things or I feel let down. I try to do that so I watch wrestling from a more just watch to enjoy. If it's not good, it's not good. If it's great, then I leave even happier than I did coming in. That's kind of the method I use to watch wrestling nowadays. I don't know if anybody else does the same thing. Let me know. So... This card, it wasn't the greatest. You know, and I was trying to figure out, there's only five matches. And they only had five matches promoted all the way up until today. So I was trying to figure out how long this show's even going to go. So I was shocked when it was able to go the whole three hours. When, three hour show for five matches. And for the most part, the matches were good. Didn't feel like it dragged on. Didn't feel like anything was too long. I mean, yeah, I could one or two of the matches went shorter. Like the women's towel match or, you know, the last man standing match. Sure. If we're going to nitpick, yeah, they sure. I thought maybe they should have. But out of five or out of ten, I guess, we're right off ten. I thought the show was a six or seven. Wasn't terrible. You know, I'll put even, I'll put a seven. A seven. A, se- a seven. We'll call it a seven out of ten. I thought it was a pretty decent show. I didn't find any spots where I was bored. I didn't feel like I wanted to just leave. So, it did its job on that part for me. So, now we'll get into the actual matches. Let me know your guys' ratings in the comment of the video. How you rated the show. Everyone's opinion is respected. So, be cordial in the comments, of course, as always. But, we started with the tag title matches. Kicked us off. The Undisputed Tag Titles. Judgment's Days. Finn Balor and Damian Priest versus... Cody Rhodes, I don't know why I almost blinked, Cody Rhodes and Jay Uso. I thought it was solid, you know, the whole thing kicked off with Cody brought Jay over to Raw from SmackDown after Jay quit the bloodline. You know, Judgment Day has been courting him, this, that, and instead him and Cody made allies together and both had the goal of taking down Judgment Day and taking the tag titles. You know, easy kind of storytelling worked, and the match itself built up for that. The match, you know, continued the storyline of the dissension of Judgment Day between, you know, Finn and Priest and all that they had. Now this, losing the titles. You know, Rhea's going to be upset. You saw how upset Rhea got when Dom lost the North American Championship for a day. You know, she was very mad and thankfully went back. But now Priest and... Bauer lose theirs, and it's coming very clear who the leader of Judgment Day is. I, you know, Finn, I think, on, character, on screen for a while was labeled it, but Rhea Ripley is definitely, or Mommy, is definitely the leader of Judgment Day. So we'll have to see what she thinks about it. The match itself, I thought, was very good. I thought the match was very good. You know, it started out early, Cody and Jay, you know, they were doing great. They were dominating. They were working the legs of the big man you know just simple sound wrestling 101 work the legs of a big man keep him down keep him planted you know jay hit a big spear you know that was a shout out to roman that well not shout out a call back to roman you know hitting a spear like his cousin does to win matches that in favor brought out Rhea and dom and that swung things into judgment day's ways Sorry, why did I give too much? All right. Anyway, you know, including things of like South of Heaven onto the barricade. Not the barricade, sorry. The hardest part of the ring, you know, Razor's Edge, Coup de Gras, just all this stuff, all Judgment Day. 
you know, Mommy, Rhea was trying to seduce Jay, who was going for splashes up top. Jay's a better man than a lot of people did. He didn't give in. It was not until J.D. McDonough got involved. He was trying to hit, I think, Priest with the briefcase. Not Priest. Um, was he holding... I think it might have been holding Jay. I think. And one of them, or Cody, one of them moved. Priest got hit in the face with it. That laid him out across the table. So he was incapacitated. That left Finn one on one in the ring. And, you know, they hit, you know, Jay hit super kicks. You know, there's, you know, Cody cutters, this, that, taking all the spots. Crossroads, one, two, three. Cody Rose and Jey Uso are your new tag team champions. Very high-paced, very action-packed, no real slow spots. Continues the storyline of dissension between the Judgment Day. You know, you know, showed Mommy's Rhea's frustrations are starting to really boil. You know, Cody and Jay, you know, formed this alliance. You know, Cody wasn't sure if he could trust Jay because, you know, Jay did some screwing him over. I mean, Cody, like they mentioned in the broadcast, would be world champion if it weren't for, like, Jay and when he was part of Bloodline. So, Jay earned Cody's respect and trust. They leave the tag champions. Judgment Day is even looking worse and worse. You know, problems are occurring. You know, they got the whole Bloodline partnership. Things didn't go well for the Bloodline later on. That all leads to Roman's return on Friday. It's very interesting time. So I love the match. I rated it out of five. I rated it a three point five or four out of five. I thought it did everything it needed to do. I think it continues stories with the judgment day. Gives a new direction for the tag titles of Cody and Jay, a first time partnership. You know, a cool another spot that was cool in that match, by the way, is Cody and Jay actually hit a one D, which is a move that Usos used. Him and his brother used so the fact that Jay brought that over and is now using of Cody just kind of shows a lot. You know, I kind of forgot that Cody was a six-time tag champion before. You know, because you always remember his single stuff now: with Bob Holly, Ted DiBiase Jr., Gold Dust. You know, he's held it with a lot of people. Now you can add Jay Uso as a tag champion. Top out a random pairing. Well, we have fought those two be tag team champions together a year ago. Hell no, but they are now. So congratulations to Cody Rhodes and Jay Uso. Look forward to seeing where that angle goes. Next match, we got Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits. I, do they have a, anybody know, can someone let me know in the comments, do they have a team name yet? I couldn't hear it. I might miss if they do. But Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits versus Santos Escobar, Rey Mysterio, and... A partner that Ray called and was supposed to show up. Well, that partner did not show up right away. So essentially the match was a three on two handicap match. Showing the dominance, the absolute dominance of Lashley and the Street Profits together. I think the presentation of that group is very strong. They're presenting Lashley big. And I like the more serious approach of the Street Profits. I think that that team's going to go very far. I'm curious though because... You know, they did allude to a commentary, and you could see it a little bit, was Montez's, there was, as they were called, Montez's arrogance, would that start getting on the nerves of Bobby Lashley? And, you know, Corey, of course, no, no, the Almighty got this. You know, Cole kept asking those questions. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly off the top of my head, because this is an instant reaction, Montez is the one that got pinned as well. So, curious to see. How that might work with those. But dominating. And then all of a sudden. Mid-match. Because Ray keeps trying to tag somebody. Santos has been incapacitated. He's He was. You know it's been pretty much those three versus Ray. For a good half of the match. All of a sudden. This horrible. Horrible remix. Of Carlito's old theme song hits. They call it the Death Rebel version. So they must not own. They must not own the rights to that I spit in the face of people who don't want to be cool original song. But Carlito, after the months and months of speculation since his appearance at Backlash, you know, all the rumors if he's been signed, but he hasn't been used. Carlito is back. He comes in. 
hits his high spots, hits a backstabber. Ray, Santos, and Carlito get the win. It was revealed Carlito was the third man. Great match. Great. I Really, the whole match was built off the pop mid-match. They wanted a large pop mid-match when everybody thought it was just going to be a beat-down squash match. They got it. Big pop. Everybody, I think, was confused at the beginning because, again, Carlito's song was remixed. Why? Why change good songs, man? I guess it, it must be a... They don't own the rights to the song, so they can't use it thing anymore, so they have to make a remix of it. Either way, the remix was awful. I'm gonna, It's going to take me some use to get to. The match was average, but I don't think it was supposed to be really a great match. It was built for the return of Carlito. That's what the match was built off of. They executed it. The pop for Carlito was great once people realized who it was. No complaints. I would say... 2.5, 3 out of 5, maybe. You know, still some great spots. Still showed dominance with Lashley, Ray, I mean, Lashley, Montez, and Angela Dawkins. Did everything it needed to do. Got the late spot. Showed dominance on Lashley's team side. So, can all hug and move on, right? <laughs> I am curious, though, and let me know. What do you guys want to see as the next direction for Carlito, you know, what few do you, what few do you want to see him start first? Who do you want to see him face? And what do you think's next for Lashley and the Street Profits since they lost the match? Let me know. Does Montez stay in? Does he get kicked out? I want to hear all your guys' thoughts on every match. What you think the next step should be and all that. Up next, we got the women's triple threat title match. Io Sky versus Charlotte Flair versus Asuka. This match, I'm going to be honest, I had no hype. I wasn't really entertained going in. And I think it translated through. It was an okay match. But I'm just, you know, I feel like we've been seeing that kind of combination of matches in the women's division for a while now. Some kind of combination of Asuka and Charlotte, especially. You know, before this match, it was Asuka, Charlotte, Bianca. Now it's Asuka, Charlotte, Io. It's just always the same combination. It's just kind of tiresome. You know, I thought... I'm glad. I thought EO was going to lose, but she didn't. I'm glad she retained. I'm very happy about that. I kind of thought the play of EO before the match wanted Bailey to stay backstage. She did not want Bailey to come out to ringside. She wanted to do it on her own because obviously Bailey in the past, her interference has led to losses for EO. So she wanted to go out there and do it on her own. I thought that might backfire, but thankfully I was wrong. The match itself was, you know, okay. Again, as I mentioned, started out with Asuka misting Charlotte right out of the gate. Right when the bell was rung, Asuka hit the miss, so Charlotte couldn't see and, you know, was incapacitated for a little bit. You know, a lot of it also was EO and Asuka working together, keeping Charlotte down. You know, they had a cool submission spot where Asuka had like a leg lock and then EO had a cross face on. You know, a couple moon salt spots. It's really clunky, too. I will say the match got really sloppy at times, too. I'm not going to be a hard critic because I thought it was okay, but it did get very sloppy at times. You know, like this moon salt spots. It looked like EO or Asuka, one of them were too far when EO went to do the moon salt off the top rope. But it looked like EO pretty much hit the whole cement and didn't barely even touch Asuka. I mean, Asuka got up first before EO. And that's a trademark EO move, so I don't know what happened there. You know, Charlotte hit one right after. You know, Charlotte hit a double German suplex, which was cool. There's some cool spots. A lot of good things in the match. It just, I think since we've seen those combinations of matches so many times, it just gets redundant. But it picked up when Bailey decided not to listen to EO. Went out there, started cheering EO on, rooting her on. I believe that she ended up distracting the referee enough where EO was able to hit was it, it was Asuka I believe with with something whatever it was a title or something and that opened up for EO to then hit the moonsault right afterwards and get the pin for the one two three so Bailey's distraction actually led to a win in a title defense retaining Instead of a loss this time. But I am curious to see going forward on SmackDown what EO thinks about the interference. Because even though it helped her win, she did directly tell Bailey she didn't want any help. 
So we'll see. But thankfully, we don't have a 15th Charlotte Flair title reign. That's what I was worried about. If I'm going to be honest. I thought we were going to get our Charlotte title reign tonight. We didn't. Well done on the booking on that part. Very curious. You know, hopefully they can start developing some more women so we don't have the same combinations of matches of Asuka and Charlotte involved with some other random person. Asuka is going to NXT to face Roxanne, so maybe Asuka's moving on some some different stuff. So, let's find Charlotte Flair something else to do, too. How about that? She don't need the title all the time. But congratulations to Miss EO Sky on successfully defending her title. Up next, this is a match I was looking for. You could see it. C Nation dripped out. LA Knight shirt I thought would have been here by now. It's not. But LA Knight... And John Cena, the GOAT, versus the Bloodline, Sola Sokoa, and Jimmy Uso. The match itself, you know, I think was just to kind of showcase LA Knight, to be honest with you. You know, no one I think was expecting a five-star wrestling match with it, but it was still decent. You know, a lot of it was the traditional John match. I think John worked his ass off to really put LA Knight over here. They even brought in Pat McAfee to do commentary for it, which was cool. Nice ad. Even though he could have really went without trying to campaign WrestleMania to come to Indianapolis. Who the hell wants to see WrestleMania there? Anybody want to see WrestleMania in Indianapolis? Let me know. But that was cool. So you had those two. You had Paul Heyman, full gray hair. Vince might not be around as much right now because I would never have thought to be seeing Dudley employee walking off a full head of gray hair. He was on the phone the whole time talking to the tribal chief, literally providing play-by-play for the tribal chief who returns this Friday. You know, a lot of it though was a lot of the match was seen again as ass whooped with LA Knight watching on the apron, you know, urging him to get there. You know, the bloodline dominated pretty much the most of the match. Eventually, L.A. got the tag. His hot spots was doing this whole cool spot. Punch, yeah, punch, yeah, 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 yeah. Super cool. You know, the BFT, you can't see, means he got all the baby face hot spots. Cena did let pretty much, a lot of the moves on Cena and L.A. Knight's side was by L.A. Knight. Cena pretty much gave him L.A. Knight the whole spotlight, and it paid off because the fans were going crazy. The Yaz were crazy. You know, Let's Go Cena's were crazy. The atmosphere for that match was loud. It got it did what it needed to do. It put LA Knight over. It's building a momentum behind him. I'm sure to an eventual match against Roman Reigns. I mean, this is where it's heading. LA Knight versus Roman. I'm sure at some point down the line it's happening soon. It did that. You know, it keeps Cena's involvement with the bloodline. It also causes an interesting scenario... That the other thing that is brought up that just built a story is once, as mentioned, Roman Reigns will be here on SmackDown on Friday. And what's he going to think about Jimmy and Solo Sokoa coming off a loss? The Tribal Chief, you know, is going to be pissed because Jimmy's been pretty much acting like the, he's the Tribal Chief while Roman's been gone. Well, the actual Tribal Chief, the one, will be here on SmackDown, and he will not be, I'm sure, a very happy man of Jimmy and Solo after losing. And with Jimmy, Jimmy's pretty much re invited himself back into a bloodline. That one should be addressed, too. Roman never said Jimmy could rejoin, so he forced himself back in. They're losing matches with him in charge. That scenario on SmackDown is going to be very, very fun to watch. Lastly, match five. The last man standing match for the World Heavyweight Championship. Seth freaking Rollins versus Shinsuke Nakamura. And I thought it was good. I thought it was good. You know, last man standing matches, guys, are one of those matches they can go either really good or they can go really bad. And by bad, usually they go over time and, you know, they start rinsing and repeating the same moves, the same weapons, all that. But this one, I think, had a good balance. It was long, but I was never really bored. Again, I like the side they're tapping into a Shinsuke, the ruthless, cruel, the ruthless, sadistic side. Working the back. I, some, I still have a hard time keeping a straight face when they keep saying that Shinsuke's trying to blow Seth's back out. Like, 
I don't know the wording on there. Maybe I'm a little kid at heart. I don't know. But then talk about blowing Seth's back out and this and that with Seth's back. I can't keep a straight face steering. But it, the point makes that Shinsuke's turned merciless. He's trying to end Seth's career. It's more for it's about the title, but it's also ending Seth. You know, Seth has had back injuries, I believe they said since 2019. And that's been the whole build up for this whole story. Seth fight the uh, build of the world title means more to Seth than Seth's own health. You know, the typical babyface heel. But both guys have been doing very good at it. I am ready for it to move on. But a lot of cool spots. You know, they had the you know same old kendo sticks, but they did bring out some ladders. Fight around the arena, you know, tables. There was a table spot. I'm surprised the table didn't break. That Seth was leaning up against the table in the corner. Shinsuke full speed ahead, ran. Seth moved and went for the table, but it didn't break. So my man thought is, damn, that's one tough son of a table, man. If that thing has no give, that thing's tough, you know. Another spot that was really cool during the match was they had a ladder set up. You know, Seth's selling his back real good at this point. You know, he's had kendo sticks to it. He's been dropped on the cement. You know, they un- they unfolded the uh, padding ringside, and Seth got dropped on it a couple times. So he's really selling his ladder and I mean his back. You know, he couldn't you know set up tables or anything, but he decided. Despite that, to try to climb up the ladder as that was a good idea. And Shinsuke, of course, followed suit. Well, Seth didn't know that Shinsuke had mist in his mouth. Yeah, Shinsuke had mist in his mouth. He spit it in the face of Seth and then threw Seth through the announce table. Seth went crashing through it. Really cool. I don't know how. I thought that was it. I don't know how Seth got up, but he got up. Seth freaking Rollins got up. I thought that was it. I felt and knew. I thought we were going to be in the era of Shinsuke Nakamura. But that was not to be. That was not to be. So they keep going. They go to the crowd. I'm like high. As you can see, I'm high space detailing this quickly. Just naming some of the thought spots I thought were cool. They're in the crowd. They're fighting. They get to the tech tables, as Nicole was calling them. And they're fighting on top of it. You get Seth, who pedigreed Shinsuke on top of him. There was a stomp on top of him. Somehow Shinsuke still got up. Hit Shinsuke, I want to say... <sighs> there's this uh, spot I'm thinking of, and it might have been earlier in the match. And it's my bad. It's just a lot that you're thinking about because there's a longer match. Another cool spot was Shinsuke... Can Sasha Seth through a table? In fact, let's back up. I'm pretty sure that was actually after the ladder spot. So Seth somehow got up from the ladder. As I, if we, let's rewind here. Seth got misted on the ladder, got thrown through a table. He still got up. I believe they rolled back in the ring. There was that, that another table set up, and Shin can Sasha Seth through a table. Shin also put Seth on the table. Went on the apron and dropped, dropped double knees on Seth through a table. I mean, literally, Seth, I think, went through, no joke, like four tables. He was the one taking all the big bumps in that match until the end. So, shout to Seth for his toughness. But now, fast forward, let's get back to the ending sequence. So, we had a, Fal- we had a stomp on the uh, tech board, a pedigree on the tech board. And then Seth and Shinsuke, bless their heart, they both poured it out. Shinsuke still got up after a stomp on a tech crate. Like long black tech crate that's literally metal. Shinsuke got up, bless his heart. So Seth went for the final kill. That final kill was he picked up Shin and hit a falcon arrow. A falcon arrow off the tech table. Tech crate, and that's what it took. It took that much for Seth to retain his title. No cash ins because Rhea took Damian Priest's briefcase earlier because Priest wanted to cash in, but Rhea said his head wasn't the right spot to lose an attack house and not to do anything off, you know, off emotion. So, no cash ins. Seth Rollins retains his title. 
the uh, the first ever Tal Reign for the World Heavyweight Championship continues. Now we have to see what's next, because correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Is there another pay-per-view before Survivor Series? I don't think so. I think there's one big Saudi show, maybe, before Survivor Series. But other than that, we're on the road to Survivor Series. So, who do you, who do you guys think's next for Seth's title? And who do you want to see compete for the World Heavyweight Championship? I'm assuming Gunther is probably upcoming soon, if you have Gunther. I'm hoping not Cody. Only for the fact that Cody, if he's going to finish his story, needs to finish against Roman. A lot of buzz about CM Punk. You know, who do you guys want to see next? Who do you want to see compete for the World Heavyweight Championship? What storylines do you want to see going into Survivor Series? There's been a lot to unfolded. We had more development, the Judgment Day dissension, the Bloodline dissension, lost spotlight put on LA Knight. Again, I would rate the show around a 7. I think it did all the things it needed to do. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't great. It did what it needed to do. Nice little seven. It was, you got to remember, it was a filler. It wasn't a big four. It's not like a Road to WrestleMania pay-per-view or Road to SummerSlam. It's just a random pay-per-view that Duddy puts on so they can have one a month, which they probably don't even need, but so they can have one a month to fill time before Summer Survivor Series. So before Survivor Series. So that going in, follows okay. It did what it needed to do. Like evolved storylines. Put more, kept building around LA Knight, Cena, all of them did a great job with that. A lot of things got pushed forward, and that's what pay per views need to do because you can't have storylines evolved without some kind of payoffs to make things keep going. So, that's my thoughts on Dunny Fastlane. I haven't done one of these videos or any kind of talks in a long time, so I'm a bit rusty, so I apologize. It's been a while doing this kind of thing. But again, let me know how you guys like Fastlane. I don't know if you'll see it Sunday the 8th or Monday the 9th. Let me know, though. You'll have a couple days to think about it. What are your favorite parts? What are your least liked parts? What did you rate the pay-per-view as a whole? I want to hear from you guys. Because I'm loving doing wrestling content again. It's what I enjoy. It's fun. Until I can start streaming again, this is kind of how I'm doing it. So, Love to hear from you guys. Love to hear what your guys' taste is. And I will see you next video. Stay golden, my friends.